The African Development Bank, AFDB President Dr. Akimumi Adishino, recently said that the highway to wealth on the continent is from the export of value-added agricultural products. He was speaking at the 2023 African Investment Forum Marketplace in Marrakesh, Morocco, on the theme Unlocking Africa's Value Chains. Adishino, while revealing that Africa must end the export of raw agricultural commodities, said... Opening up Africa's economic potential along its agricultural value chain would make it possible for the launch of the Alliance for Special Agro-Industrial Processing Zones, that is called ZAPS, and uh, this will make Africa a global player in food and agriculture. So this morning, joining me from Kaduna is Ibrahim Megari Amadu. Is the founder and CEO of Rice Africa Technologies. Of course, Rice Africa Technologies is a tech-driven Greek optimization service provider with operations in Nigeria and Tanzania. And of course, uh, there's the hope that it will expand to Rwanda. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining us on Business Edge. Thank you, Oleko. Thank you for having me. Now, um, the African Development Bank estimates that Africa loses about $75 billion annually due to the export of raw materials instead of finished goods. And um, the president, additional, said that Africa must end the export of raw agricultural commodities. So why does Africa find it more convenient to export its raw materials than having to process them and have a more diversified market? Um, thank you, Lekan. Before answering your question, I think it would also be very important to add uh, to this conversation uh, by quoting what uh, Dr. Adeshina said uh, a few years ago. And I quote, he said, in 2017, um, Africa spent about 64.5 billion US dollars on importing food. And we may spend even more in subsequent years. Currently, we're spending over 100 billion. And he said, this is unsustainable, irresponsible, and unaffordable. It is also completely unnecessary because Africa has 65% of the world's remaining uncultivated arable land, an abundance of fresh water, and about 300 days of sunshine every year. And more than 60% of Africa's working population is engaged in agriculture. And the soil across most of the continent is rich and vital. If you look at from Cape Town to Casablanca, you know. So Africa exports raw materials I think, in my own opinion, for the same reasons others do uh, export, simply to end forex. And um, I think the answer is, there's not too wrong, actually, in my own opinion, uh, in exporting raw materials. Even industrial economics do that. But the problem is, um, do we have the wherewithal, we have the willpower to stop such exports? And, and why are we still exporting? If you look at what we are exporting at the moment, um, Africa agricultural exports are dominated by a few product categories. And, and the top five are cocoa, edible fruits and nuts, coffee, mm. tea and spices, fish and edible vegetables and roots. This makes up about 53% of all agricultural exports. So my honest answer is that there's nothing actually wrong in exporting raw materials. Like I said, after all, industrial uh, economics like the U.S. and uh, most countries in Europe do export. Our, our, our country recently imported seeds from, uh, wheat seeds from the United States. So there's actually nothing wrong in exporting raw materials. What is wrong, in my opinion, is not producing enough and not processing in your country. And uh, that, I think that is what uh, the SAPs, um, I know you're going to go into that, and what the AFDB is trying to address. There's nothing wrong in exporting raw materials, what is wrong with not processing in your country and not producing enough? I hope you get me. Of course. So what are now the challenges when it comes to um, local production, when it comes to um, creation of that value chain where you are able to domicile um, the processing and production of the raw materials and transforming it into um, a finished product. What are the issues uh, that Nigeria or Africa is faced with in that regards? A lot. Um, let me give you a con context so, so that our viewers can actually see the picture of what Dr. Adeshina and, and the AFDV are trying to reverse. Um, one crop that gives you a very good example of the, extra the exploitative nature of extractive agriculture is cocoa. 
And I, I don't know if you're aware that 70% of the global cocoa production is from West Africa, Africa's Ghana, Nigeria. 70% of the cocoa production. So um, if, you, if, you, if you just do a Google search, in 2021, um, the entire export from Africa of cocoa amounted to about a little bit about 7.1 billion USD. Compare that with the, the, the net sales of top 10 chocolate manufacturing companies in the world. It's, it was about 87.3 billion as against 7.1 in export. So, and there are a lot of challenges, of course, when it comes to domiciling this uh, before we, we see the success of these subs and um, attended problems as regards to uh, um, production. You know, if you remember, I mentioned there's no problem in exporting. Our problem is under productivity. The under productivity of the smallholder farmer in Africa is the biggest culprit. And, and if you look at African agriculture, 80% of the food we eat in Africa is produced by uh, uh, um, smallholder farmers. These one, uh, smallholder farmers are facing various challenges from lack of mechanized uh, land preparation to lack of access to uh, high yielding seeds, lack of access to qualitative chemicals, lack of access to affordable on-time de delivery of fertilizer, uncorrupted affordable on-time delivery of fertilizer, lack of access to best agronomic practices, lack of access to um, mechanized harvesting, for instance. And of course, they don't have access to a structured market. So I think these are the attendant problem. And based on that, I was doing a little research on the cocoa production system. The Ghanaian government just recently came up with a policy that encouraged local players in Ghana to, pro to process cocoa within Ghana instead of the export that has been going on for over 100 years. And what do we have now? Those small companies in Ghana that are battling with global behemoths in the chocolate factory in in industry, trying to process in Ghana, are not facing the problems of importation of dairy products because you can process chocolate without meat. Hmm. Importation of sugar. And of course, lack of steady electricity, cold chain, because the chocolate manufacturing process has a lot to do with the cold chain. So these are some of the problems that I think we need to look into before we now start uh, investing heavily in these subs that the, the African Development uh, Bank is talking about. Uh, most definitely, we are going to um, delve further into these issues and see what probable solutions might be apt to address them. But then, uh, Ibrahim, you just stay with us. We'll go on a short break, and when we return, we'll continue with the conversation. Do stay with us. Of course, you are watching Business Edge on New Central Television, and we have been um, talking to Ibrahim Megari uh, Ahmadu, who is the founder of the CEO of Rise Africa Technologies, and uh, we have been considering ways by which, uh, which by which to escalate uh, uh, Africa's agricultural value chain and see how growth can come to it. So let me just go back to um, Ibrahim. You talked about um, different challenges or bottlenecks, as the case may be, looking at the issues of lack of electricity, um, lack in rules of trade, and of course, uh, modernized equipment and some other areas that are impediments to um, growing um, uh, Africa's agri-based value. So let me just um, now now, at this point, uh, bring in the issue of the SABs uh, that we um, earlier mentioned um, in goings. Now, looking at the special agro-industrial processing zones, uh, which are uh, designated areas where agricultural products are processed and manufactured into finished goods uh, for exports. Now, what does it entail and how well can that help in unlocking Africa's value chains? I, I, I must first of all salute the courage of... Um... The, the AFDB, led by our very own Dr. Adewuna Adishina. And I think the SAFS concept, it's a, it's, it's a game changer. Uh, if we look at it uh, 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 holistically, uh, instead of uh, um, looking at the solution in bits and pieces. For the benefit of our, our viewers, um, the SAFS, that special agro processing zones, are going to be agro-based development initiatives designed to concentrate high agro-processing activities within areas of high agricultural potential to boost productivity and integrated production, processing and marketing of agricultural uh, commodities. And they are purposely going to be built at, with shared facilities to enable agricultural producers, processors, aggregators, and distributors to operate in the same vicinity, just like a shared uh, cluster, to reduce transaction costs and share business development services for increased productivity and competitiveness. This 
uh, ultimately will lead to um, the, uh, the cost of production coming down. And because it's, it's going to be a sort of a cluster that will promote interdependence, enhance productivity and competitiveness. And also by bringing uh, adequate infrastructure, uh, as in energy, water, roads, and ICT to rural areas, these uh, special agro processing zones will attract investments from private agro industrialists, entrepreneurs, and they will contribute tremendously to the social and economic development of the rural areas. And they're also going to be located in peri urban areas to, re to reduce um, rural urban migration. And I think, like I said, uh, if we pull this through, if the uh, African process, uh, African Development Bank pulls this through, it's going to be a game changer. It's going to open up our agricultural uh, value chain extremely well because uh, it's, uh, it's going to bring in a lot of job employment. It's going to bring in investment to rural areas closer to the sources of raw materials. And of course, it's going to bring down the cost of food production. And like I said, we have to take everything in, in not in bits, in holistically. As we're ramping up our production and we are setting up these agro processing zones, we will have enough to feed Africa. And of course, we'll have enough to export and earn the desired foreign exchange and also fill the world. So I think it's a very interesting initiative that uh, has to be welcomed by all interested uh, agro participants in, in the continent. And coupled with that, Brian, we know that it's also designed to attract investments, as you have said, and create jobs in the agricultural sector. And looking at the fact that um, the value chains will be broken down into various specialized areas and expertise will be needed in those areas. But then there are still some concerns as regards um, incentives uh, for investors, because you mentioned that it will attract investments. Uh, there are other issues that are, has to do with um, tax breaks, access to land, who gets what portion of land in terms of their ability to cultivate the land, um, capacity building, infrastructure, um, streamlined regulatory processes. All these are technical areas are also a source for concern for stakeholders and those who may want to um, key into such a project. So how should these be addressed if Africa hopes to change um, its economic narrative? I, I absolutely agree with you. Definitely all these things that we mentioned, tax breaks, access to land, insecurity, for instance. In, uh, I mean, uh, the, the government, before you in, in, encourage private investors to invest in agro processing zones, you have to tackle the issue of insecurity, provide good road networks, which is basically like in most of sub-Saharan Africa, closer to the sources of raw materials. Like, oh yeah, you, you got a spot on. These are very important uh, amenities that will complement the, the establishment of those agro processing zones. If you remember, I mentioned to you the initiative by the by, by the, uh, the government in Ghana of encouraging private investors to set up factories within Ghana to process cocoa. And, uh, and now those factories are complaining that they have to now import sugar. Fortunately, because of the African Free Trade Zone uh, initiative, they are now importing sugar from South Africa. They, are, they, they, they go to Europe to import milk because they don't have a dairy a very very stable and and, 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 and and very active dairy sector in ghana so these are all requirements that the the governments african governments must look into it's not just like i said it's not just going to be in bits and pieces it is a holistic uh, in, in environment production is going on providing security providing tax reliefs providing um, incentives for for investors providing good road networks, electricity, stable power, and all those things are very important in the success of the agro processing zones. And if we get it right, I'm telling you, it's going to open up the whole continent and Africa is going to be the food basket and the food, the, the food manufacturing headquarters of the whole world. Okay, so let's quickly tie that to the issue of the um, African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement. Uh, earlier on, you said that um, that could just be um, one pointer that might help um, accelerate this conversation and, of course, um, the initiative of the FDB concerning Africa. But then if you are going to tie together, because we know that in some countries, uh, this um, agreement has not been fully implemented we still have restrictions in some borders we still have some bottlenecks in some african countries depending on their level of development and capacity to um fully internalize um the, this um, particular um trade agreement it has not been um 
able, most especially for these countries, to um, have um, a, 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 a kind of connection or a kind of relationship between other African countries in terms of growing agricultural um, products and exports in, in that line. So if we are going to fully um, bring SAPs and um, the AFCFTA together and merge them together, how do you think that will help? What are the areas do you think should be considered when we are to deal with issues uh, with issues as regards these two and how well can we implement them to further liberate um, the African economy? Thank you very much. Um, I agree. Um, there are some restrictions here and there, but that doesn't take away the fact that the, that the African continental free area is uh, it's a wonderful initiative. And um, the World Economic Forum, according to its inside report on that particular opportunity, stated that the free trade area, the African free trade area, is one of the world's largest by a number of people and economic size. Okay, uh, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, sorry to cut in. Just give us a few seconds. I'd like you to just hold your thought for a few seconds. When we return, we'll have you um, say what you want to say and wrap it up. Just stay with us. Okay, Brian, thank you so much uh, for your understanding. Of course, our viewers appreciate your um, attention to, to this. So, um, Ibrahim, I'd like you to just conclude or continue with your summation as regards uh, bringing the SABS initiative and, of course, AFCFTA together to see how it can revolutionize um, Africa's economy. So, I was, I was saying um, I agree with the fact that there are a lot of um, stumbling blocks. Some few countries are not yet on board, but still, if you look at what the World Economic Forum gave in terms of its insight in the opportunities of the um, African free trade and continental free trade area, it stated that it's, the, it's one of the world's largest by number of people and economic size, and it is projected to host about 1.7 billion people and oversee uh, a transaction in the excess of 6.7 trillion in consumer and business spending by the year 2020. That gives you the extent of the potential of the African free trade zone. And uh, according to that same report, agriculture has exceptional potential for increasing inter-African trade. Like I mentioned to you, Ghanaian manufacturers of, uh, of, of, of cocoa now, uh, manufacturers of chocolate, are importing sugar from, from, from South Africa. Meeting local demand, accelerating GDP growth, creating new jobs, improving exclusivity, Due to the upstream and the downstream linkages that this will, the, the African free continental uh, area will, will, will provide. It will also increase value addition, it will meet new local demand, and it will bring, especially smallholder farmers, who have told you that they are, the smallholder farmers are responsible for the production of over 80% of the food that we consume in Africa. It, this, this, this free trade area will bring them into a wider uh, uh, supply chain. And there are boundless opportunities in the after for, for new investment in, in agro-processing, for instance. You can imagine a, a market of over 6.7 trillion uh, with, with uh, over 1.7 billion just around you in one continent. If we, if we scale up our production, we establish these subs that the AFDB is talking about, taking advantage, making, getting it right, fixing all the, the little, little challenges that we have, turn Africa into a mad production house, and then we don't even have to take it out because we have a market of over, over 1.7 billion mm. with this consumer spending of over 6.7 trillion in the, in the, by the year 2030, according to all economic forums. So okay. the opportunities are massive for our continent. Okay, $853 million will be mobilized in one area. $661 million will also be um, sought for from partners. So quickly, uh, Ibrahim, just in about a minute, uh, which countries do you think the AFDB should be focusing on in terms of the investments of these funds? To be very frank with you, I'm, I'm being very modest here, not because I'm a Nigerian, but I think Nigeria is the go-to place for these reasons. We have the, the size, the population size, we have the market, we are over 200 million people. We have the youthful population, and agriculture and agri-technology is on the rise in Nigeria. And we have, for instance, this particular government of Asawaji Bola Tinibu has just uh, appointed to be, to be as, as a person, I'm very excited with the appointment of a gentleman that's from the agri sector to, to head and lead one of the biggest fund, one of uh the biggest thing to happen to our agriculture in Nigeria is the establishment of the Nigerian Agricultural Development Fund. Okay. Recently, the president appointed a gentleman that's from the sector, from the private sector-driven person, who we believe 
if he brings his private sector okay. experience to bear in that fund, Nigeria will take advantage of this, and Nigeria is the place to go because we have the enabling environment. And if we get it right, we fix okay. our problems. Nigeria can be become the the supply chain of. Africa can start from Nigeria. Okay, yeah. I see how patriotic you are about Nigeria, Brian uh, Megari Akmadu, but then, you. of course, you are the founder, CEO of Rise Africa Technologies. Uh, thank you so much um, for your contribution this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Now, economists uh, believe that um, the export of processed agricultural products can help Africa reduce its reliance on imports. And Africa currently imports a large proportion of its processed uh, agricultural products. Uh, but then by exporting more processed agricultural products, uh, more foreign exchange comes in, more jobs are created, the value chain processes become more specialized and robust, and the overall economy will feel the positive impact in no time.